Thank you all for coming. I'm John Nicholson, director of the Newhouse Sports Media Center. This, of course, is Coach Jim Beheim, Hall of Fame coach of the Syracuse University Orange Men, better known as the quarterback of my <laughs> all-university intramural football team <laughs> in 1966. Yeah. Okay, it was his team, let's be honest, he was, he was the quarterback. <laughs> Jim and I have talked for many years about sports media, which I've spent all my adult life in, and he has been the subject and or victim of many times over the years. <laughs> so I want to start with this. Casey Stengel, the great Yankees and later Mets manager, used to hang out in bars <laughs> with the writers who covered him, and he called them my writers. <laughs> How would you describe your relationship with the folks who cover you and your team? Well, we don't hang out together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's changed. Uh, you know, in the old days, uh, the players did go out and, you know, we spend a lot of time with the media. And I think the media, you know, at that time, they were more friendly and wanted to be friendly. And you can't be friendly with somebody and then write bad stuff about them the next day because when you're covering a team like that, uh, you need access to those guys. And if you start to write things about what they're doing at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're obviously going to uh, fracture that relationship. So I never think it's a good thing to hang out with the media because it's not that kind of relationship. Uh, I'm not in it to be your friend. I'm in it to give you the information you ask for. I really, I really have nothing against the media, and I, for the most part, like the media. Uh, people don't think that, but I do. Uh, I'm not quite as sarcastic as I used to be. I used to be pretty bad growing up as a young coach um, because I really didn't want to spend time with the media. I didn't want to have any part of it. I didn't want to talk to them. I just wanted to do my job. And uh, as I've gone through the years, I've learned that uh, part of the job is to do things with the media. And, uh, you know, there's just so many things that happen that in, in terms of questions they'll ask. And it's like, well, coach, they're saying. Who's saying? Who the hell is saying? What do you mean? You're saying. That's who's saying it uh, when it's a critical question. So just if you have that question, just ask it. Don't say somebody else is saying it. You're thinking it or you want to say it. But uh, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a necessary part of the, of the business. And, uh, you know, as a coach, you just want to get through it, guide your way through it as much as you can. And I realize that, the, again, I get along with most of the people in the media, uh, vast, vast majority. But when you cover some a team, when you're a beat reporter, um, you know, you're going to have conflicts over a long period of time. People always say about me, well, he likes national media, not the local media. Well, that's because they come in once a year. You know, they're nice. <laughs> they're nice. They say good things for the most part, and they leave. You know, when you cover somebody every day, I mean, there's bound to be times you're going to write or say something that I'm not going to like. And, you know, I've tried to get better on that, but it, it, it's always in the back of my mind there, what, what you said or wrote. And it's sometimes hard for me to get around that. But, uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting relationship, but again, uh, it's just part of the job and what you have to do. And um, again, you know, it's, uh, I respect most of the people in the media, media business. Back in 2003, after you and your team won the national championship, I had a class of freshmen coming out to the field house to get briefed by some folks on covering sports. And you happened to be coming down the hall at the field house, carrying in your hand, by the way, a Carmelo bar. And I said, Coach, can you give these students some advice? And this is what you said. Be nice to me, and I'll be nice to you. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's not what they teach here in journalism, uh, but the facts are, if you really look closely, other, if you exclude talk show hosts, most of the people that succeed in the journalistic business and the media, you know, written word or on TV, are good people. They're good guys. 
and uh, you know you can name a lot of names. I've worked here with Mike Tirico. He did my show when he was a sophomore in college. He did my. He was a network anchor here, in town. Uh, you know Bob Costas, who you know I did stuff with here. Dick Stockton, Marv Albert. Uh, you know obviously Sean McDonough. And so many, so many other guys. The ones that are successful are usually pretty, pretty good, pretty nice guys, and they get access, they get information, uh, they know they can call me anytime, and I'll give them something if I have it. Um, so I, I think that uh, you know that's not what they teach, but that's really I think the best way to be successful, in my opinion, is to get along well with the people you cover. Uh, if you're in New York City, that pretty pretty much goes out the window, because that's not the way it works there. But uh, you know, it doesn't have to be adversarial. But you know, at times it's going to be, uh, you know. But talk show radio is kind of poisoned everything. The the problem with talk show radio is when people hear it on there, they think <coughs> a month later that it's a fact. <laughs> you know, when it, it's like a letter to the editor. You know, it says that, well, he didn't recruit this guy, he didn't recruit that guy, and, you know, never won a big game. When the facts are that you did recruit those guys and you won a lot of big games. But two months later, you'll see somebody on the street and they'll say, be talking, kind of, yeah, Bill Beheim has never won these big games. He's never, he didn't recruit these two guys. Well, it's not true, but it was in print. You know, I've always thought about editorials, letters to the editor, especially a talk show. You know, we are all allowed an opinion in this country, but there's nowhere in the Constitution that says you have the right to print it in the paper. Do you read the comments on Syracuse.com after the... No, my <laughs> wife does, unfortunately. <laughs> she goes, did you see this? I said, no. <laughs> the smartest guy I've ever known was Dave Gavitt. He founded the Big East. He was an Olympic basketball coach, coach at Providence, one of the best coaches ever, and, and the guy that founded the Big East put it together, got a bunch of idiots to stay together who didn't know what the hell they were doing, and he, he made a conference out of nothing. And what Dave Gavin did when he was coaching, he did not read the newspaper, he did not listen to radio or TV the entire basketball season. So when a reporter would ask him at a press conference, well, what did you think about this and this or that arc? And, I don't know. Didn't read it. Uh, I can't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> From time to time, I, th I think we've heard you say, oh, I, I didn't listen to that. But you, you do listen sometimes, anyhow. Yeah. And it gets under your skin still sometimes, yes? Oh, yeah, I think you're human. I mean, it, uh, after 40 years, it probably doesn't bother me as much as it used to in the first 20. I think it takes about 30 years, and then you start to, you know, ignore it. But... You know, you're, it's human nature. You're sensitive and to things, and especially, particularly when there's things that are not true. You know, I mean, somebody can write in an opinion that I, you know, he doesn't win enough, or he should have won. You know, like he's only won one national championship. You know, I mean, there's only about 35 coaches that have actually won a national championship, but uh, you know, it's. Uh, Things like that, or he, like I said earlier, we had a couple of really good players, and somebody wrote in, well, he didn't even recruit those guys when I was the only one that recruited them. Usually it's a team effort to recruit. But, you know, those things that get in, they get under your skin a little bit, but uh, it's just, it is it is what it is. And, you know, it's like uh, we've been fortunate. We've won about 75% of, of our games, but every year somebody writes, you know, we should be playing man-to-man. -man. He should be doing this. And Mike Tirico once said, well, what has he got to win, 80% of his games? And so I, I guess sometimes you just have to let that stuff go. I'm just not very good at that. Is that the dopiest question a reporter can ask you after a game? Coach, why didn't you play man-to-man -man at this point? Well, about eight years ago, every game, because we played both. And really, yeah. it's, it's, it's harder to play both because you have to have two preparations. It's almost like taking two classes at once, and one's teaching on one thing and another's teaching on something else, and you've got to study and prepare for questions on both things. Well, it's the same thing if you're playing man-to-man. -man, it's a certain preparation and then you're playing zone, it's a different preparation. Now, it makes the other team prepare a little bit more, too, but it, it's really harder to do. And you're even always, sometimes you're even thinking, well, should we switch to zone or should we switch back to man-to-man? -man? And so 
if you start to even think you could second guess yourself, then every other one of the 30,000 people in the Cary Dome are second guessing you too. So uh, a few years ago, we just felt we'd go man straight zone. And I said at the time, you don't need to ask me again the question of why didn't you play man to man because we don't play man to man. So you don't have to think about that question. And the reality is with our defense, we do change it during the game a lot. Uh, you know, when you're a man to man coach and you get beat, they don't tell the man to man coach to play zone. And really, and what the man to man coach said is if we're getting beat, we got to play it better. So the same thing with us. If we're playing zone and we're not doing a good job, we don't change. We play it better. And it, that's really the key. A lot of the armchair quarterbacks think, well, you should switch. When they never ask a man to man coach to switch to zone. Now, why is that? That doesn't make sense. Really, logic doesn't make logical sense. But uh, it's just. Uh, this year we're going to play some man-to-man, -man, so we'll shock the world this year. We'll see. We'll you see. heard it. You we'll heard see. it here. I used to be able to say that thing and never got out, but now it's going to be out on Twitter tonight. You know, <laughs> okay, now, now you'll have I misdirected it, everybody and you'll never do it. I give it. it 10 minutes to be But there's out. still, yeah, that, that's, yeah. with the over-under, I'm taking the under for sure. But still somebody, and sometimes somebody who should know better, will, Coach, um, why, didn't you pay, why, why didn't you play some man-to-man? And what do you want to do right then? First, well, you give them the death stare, right? They don't, they don't ask me that anymore because they know we don't. And that's the danger of starting to play it again. Then they'll ask me why. Uh, a great example, my first year in coaching, we usually played both. But my first year or so, we had all freshmen. And so we, were, we played all zone and we were 15-0. and 15-0, and 0, which is, you know, in your first year, that's, that's a pretty good start. I think we were at the top five in the country. And uh, we went down to play Old Dominion, and uh, it was a great game. They were good, very good, road game, tough game. And we're behind six or eight points late, and we steal the ball three or four times. Well, it's kind of like the Virginia game was this year. All, you know, we're out of the game, and all of a sudden we're in the game, and we actually take a one-point lead with six seconds to go. And they've got the ball out of bounds. I can't quite see the clock because it's a right up overhead, but there's three – Guys who were related, ref in the game, who were related to the Old Dominion head coach, I think. And uh, <laughs> get that? Okay. See, they take everything you say very seriously. You can lie. I'm, I'm really kind of funny. People don't. <laughs> they don't always get that, but I, I can be. So they come down, and they have it on the sideline with six seconds to go. They make it inbounds, and we defend it. They make a pass. We defend that. They made a third pass. Remember, it was six seconds. They make a third pass, and I've got this on tape still. And I'm just, everybody's a bedlam in the place. And everybody's watching the play, and there's no clock at the end like there is now, just the clock overhead. And I really couldn't even see it. It was just a hard clock to see. And they make three passes, they shoot it and miss, and I'm, I'm ready to, I'm going to shake hands. With, they get the rebound. There's no stoppage of play. They pass it out and miss again. <laughs> so I'm ready to shake hands again. <laughs> they grab that one, put it up, and it goes in. And I had looked at the clock finally. I'd got, it had been double, triple zeros for two or three seconds. And the ball goes in. They win the game. The referees run off the court, and I'm standing there like congratulating the other coach. And it's a game we won. I mean, there's no question. It wasn't even two, three seconds difference. It could have been a four-second difference. But you lose, and so we're 15-1 now, and the sunny letter to the editor was, when's Bayheim going to play zone, get out of the zone and play man-to-man? -man? <laughs> <laughs> so I learned right then, really, you just don't pay attention to those people, really. It's hard, but... That's what, you, that's what you do. They don't make sense, really. The great writer, Roger Kahn, says that sports tells us a lot about society, about our times, about the way things work in the world. Howard Cosell said it's the playground of what goes on out there. What do you see as the value of media covering sports, writing about sports, broadcasting sports? Well, I think sports is a value. I think it's what we like to do. I mean, I watch TV. I love sports. I watch ping pong. 
I watch the badminton. You know, I I watch anything that's on. Two o'clock in the morning, I'll be looking around to see if there's something. It's not really sports, but if everything else is, and I watch the poker tournament. So, you know, but I, I just I like to I like I love sports. Always have. I think it's what we do or what we like. I mean, not everybody, but I think a lot of people. I think it has a value for players and growing up. My kids all played sports, and I think it has a great value, the work ethic, what you have to do. Um, I have a daughter that's, you know, swims, plays lacrosse, plays basketball, and, you know, it's. I think it's been great for them. My two sons play. Uh, I think it's been great for them. Um, I think it's, uh, you learn a lot from sports. Uh, uh, I, th I don't think you can overvalue what you can gain from being in competitive sports. And I think the the media, you know, uh, uh, the problem you have, it's like, I don't know if you follow the Ryder Cup, I'm a huge golf fan, but, you know, Danny Willett's brother said something just stupid, outrageously stupid yesterday about the Americans and their, all this negative stuff. and. You know, Danny Willett's getting killed every all day, ask, being asked questions about his brother and what he did this, and he should be there enjoying his first Ryder Cup experience. And he's asking a hundred, he's getting asked a hundred times about what his brother said. It's got nothing to do with him, at all. It's just, uh, you know, it's just what it is. And you know, you get into talk shows. I used to listen to the, uh, you know, what's his name, Mike and. Uh, like Mad a Mike dog, oh, you know, yeah. no, they're they're not really talk. They're just entertainers. But uh, <laughs> you know, Mike and the Mad Dog in New York, and I I, I got to be friends with them. And every time I said, I would see like, how can you guys possibly know how to manage the Yankees better than Joe Torre, coach the Giants better than Tom Coughlin, and know a hell of a lot more than the New York Knicks coach? How can you guys be that good? Did you ever play any sport? Of course they didn't, but they have all the answers, and it's the problem is like I said earlier in this thing when they put that out in the air enough that this guy should be fired, it almost becomes like fact rather than just two guys who are short, fat, and can't play anything. Their opinion about something, but that's that's what we where we're at. It's entertainment. It's it's not journalism. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that nobody in talk show thinks they're in journalism or thinks they're journalism, students or players, people. But I again, I, most of the people that cover us or who I see are very professional. They know what they're doing. They're prepared. And, uh, you know, they present things. You, you can always second guess a coach. A coach makes hundreds of decisions during a game, literally. not. I mean, it, it always thinks it's like you didn't call timeout or you didn't take this shot. I mean, it's there's hundreds of things you do and hundreds of things you don't do. Where a Trevor Cooney misses six shots in a row, how many people go to the game? A few here? You've been to the game? How many people, when Trevor Cooney misses three or four, get them the hell out of the game? How many people? <laughs> And, but then when he makes four in a row after that, you're going, yeah, hey, way to go, Trevor. <laughs> Where if you were coaching, he'd be sitting down next to you. <laughs> and the other thing that people don't realize, he, he is our best shooter. So I'm taking him out to put in a bad shooter? That makes not a lot of sense. But that's coaching. That's what it's about. Everybody has their opinion. Everybody sits in front. Why do we not like <coughs> soccer? in this country because there's no timeouts and you can't sub very much and you can't second guess the coach what are you going to do kick the ball better you know <laughs> run better run faster whereas a baseball coach a basketball coach football coach why'd they run on third down why didn't they pass why did they why didn't they you know why didn't he pinch hit why didn't he throw why didn't he bring in a reliever Pretty good manager in Boston got fired because he left his best pitcher in the game for one extra, one more pitch, and he <laughs> and he, he didn't bring in a bad reliever. If the guy got the guy out, nothing would have happened. But he didn't get him out. He got he lost his job. And you know we love we love to coach. We love to second guess. You know that's what we do. I do it a little bit myself sometimes when I'm watching TV. But you can't coach somebody's team. 
that's the, the hardest thing for people to know. Why didn't he put this guy in the game? Why didn't he put, well, because we know things about our players from watching them every day and being with them for a year, two, three, or four years, that we know things nobody could know. John Wooden's the greatest coach of all time in any sport. He said, I can't coach another guy's team. I don't know that team. But some guy that watches TV twice a week and is about 300 pounds sitting back in his chair is yelling at the TV at home, which I don't think he realizes I can't hear him. <laughs> or they're sitting at the top of the student section saying, what the hell is he doing now? It's hard to hear when there's 30,000 people in the dome. And as my wife will tell you, I don't listen to anybody anyway. <laughs> You the, watch a lot. The greatest quote of all was Marv Levy, a pretty good football coach. He got killed all the time because he took the Buffalo Bills to four Super Bowls and didn't win any of them. And since he's left, they haven't even got a sniff of getting in the playoffs, let alone get to the Super Bowl. And his quote, and he was a Harvard, he was kind of a smart guy. I think he went to an Ivy League school and he read Shakespeare and all that stuff, which I don't even read, read the abridged version of Shakespeare, but he said, you know, when you start thinking and listening to the fans, you'll end up sitting with the fans. All right. Yeah, you do have two master's degrees. Just saying. No, just one. Oh, yeah? Just one. Yeah. I've always told people, too. That was just a stay Well, out. see, I've been misinformed all these years. That was just to stay out of the arm, man. Ah, I just had to take the <laughs> <That's> school. <laughs> you watch I a lot. I graduated but, from Maxwell School. They don't like me to say <laughs> that, though. They like like, like me to keep that quiet. You do read, though. What do you like to read? I read the <laughs> trash books. No, I mean, not completely trash, but David Silva, John Patterson, Patricia Cornwall, uh, Coban, um, all, you know, spy movies, spy stories, and stuff like that. Although a good friend of mine is an author named Emily Giffen, who writes girl books. Anybody know Emily? That, no, nobody's read Emily Giffen? Ooh. They will now. <laughs> She's pretty good. She's a best-selling writer. You read sports magazines, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, the magazine, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I read uh, Sports Illustrated. It's a good magazine. I like the front and the back, last page the most, front part and the last page. But it's, it's a good magazine. Um, but I don't, I used to read newspapers. Now they don't really put much, many out. and They don't have much in them when they do. It's a vanishing breed. I'm a newspaper guy. I don't, I don't have a computer. It's not that I mean. It's not that I don't. Some people don't use theirs that much. I don't have one, uh, so you don't can't send me an email. The reason I don't have email is because everybody would email me, and then they'd wonder why I didn't email them back. <laughs> and I know people that spend two hours a day just answering email. I got how many here do that? You spend a lot. Of, how many people spend a lot of time on emails? No, not that many. No, that's not bad. I can do something with that two hours. I don't need to be on email. If somebody needs me, they call me. <laughs> Over the years, there must have been some writers, some reporters that you thought did a good job. No, I, I, say, I really, I like I mean, but that, that you might single out. For instance, you picked Jack McCallum well, he, to he, write your book yeah, with you. He covered, sports, he covered me for Sports Illustrated. He wrote the first really national article about me that was good. And uh, he's a good friend, become a good friend. He's a great writer. And uh, I think the book that he put together, helped me put together, it was, it was good. I mean, it, 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 it got out what I wanted to get out there. And, and he's just let me tell it in my words. And it looks like it, it's really his writing completely. We talked a lot about it over a long time. But now I like most guys. But, you know, it's, it's like Mike Lupica, who is actually from, I think, Rome, New York. Oh, and, uh, Hmm? Oneida. Yeah, Oneida. And uh, is, is a very good writer, but when we were playing in New York, uh, he was starting out, he wasn't a national name yet, and we had a guy named Pearl Washington who was a, a great player, and, you know, great kid, great charisma guy. And Mike just wanted to write things that were really necessarily true just to be sensational and we played and we lost a game in the garden pro really played great but he he could get crazy stuff sometimes and mike lupica wrote a column that i a negative about pearl and that i would be happy when he left you know without ever talking to me mm -hmm. but his mother pearl washington's mother called me on the phone crying because she would naturally assume if a writer wrote something like that they must have gotten something from me that would 
indicate that, yeah, I'll be happy when pro leaves. And so, you know, I mean, that really bothered me. And we, had, we actually had won, and I think the next game we played, Pro had a pretty good game, and I just killed Mike Lupica for 10 minutes in the press conference. <laughs> and he's never spoken to me to say, because the one thing I will tell you about guys that like him, they can dish it out. They cannot take it. They cannot take it. I've, I've known too many of them. They're good at throwing the mud, but they don't like it when somebody comes back at them. And in reality, you're better not to come back at them. But I'm just not built like that. Have you ever sat down with a writer, maybe at the local level particularly, who is writing about you and your team and said, let's hash things out because you're, you're starting to annoy me? <laughs> you know, I've been able to manage the media. When I started out, we had press before every practice. Three, ra three TV stations, a couple radios, a couple students, students, you know, eight, ten people. And you'd tape a separate one with each one because they wanted their own. And you did that every day. And you found out that of all those things, about 10, 15 seconds got on the media <laughs> each week. And so after a number of years of doing that, I said, we're just going to we'll do it twice a week. And, you know, they, had, they were a little bit, but they, it was fine. And then after a year of that, I said, you know, we don't really, we could do once a week. And so we did once a week. And that was then the next year I said, you know, let's just do after the games. And so we meet with the media after the games, go over the story of the game to answer a question, and we move on. And uh, it just eliminated a lot of questions you don't need to answer and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and it, you know, it all worked out better, I think. But... You know, you have to, sometimes you just have to work those things through and see what's, what's best. But I really, you're always going to have conflicts with people that cover you every day because they're, they're writing a lot of stuff. And it's just like if you're doing a, a three-hour game on TV, somebody's going to say some things during that three hours that, you know, I'm not going to like. And I, it's better not to listen to it, but... <coughs> Sometimes you just can't help yourself. <laughs> All right, this is my last question. We'll open it up to questions from you folks. Students sometimes will come back to me because I deal with a lot of our new house students who are covering your news conferences and say, he was mean to me, <laughs> or he didn't answer my question. And I will tell them, if you ask him a good question, chances are he will answer. Is oh, that true? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's not true. I've never not answered a question. What, so, but what would be a good question? Because I think, I think you enjoy a good question. I, I enjoy any question, really. I, I, the, the only time I have problems when I've answered, because I summarize the game pretty mm -hmm. much when the press, when, when I start. And it takes a few minutes. And I have, you know, gifted with total recall of, I remember plays in high school. I really do. In mm -hmm. ninth grade, I remember plays and games. Um, but I, I try to to evaluate what happened in the game and why we did this, why we did that, and why we lost. And it annoys me when I give that answer and somebody asks me a question which I just answered, which I just explained what happened. We took, we missed two key shots down the stretch and they got the, you know, they made a great play at the other end and that's why they won. And then, they, then somebody will say, well, coach, why did you, why did you lose the game? I just answered that. But um, for the most part, there are no dumb questions other than asking something that I've just answered. But uh, I, I don't think there's really dumb questions that much, you know, really. It's, uh, and I try to answer them, and, and I am, you know, I'm cognizant, that's a good word, of the fact that <laughs> we have a lot more students. It didn't be in the beginning, there weren't that many students. There seems to be a lot more students the last few years, and, you know, and they're all afraid to ask the questions. But, you know, they, With good reason? No, <laughs> not really. I used to be bad. I'm not that bad anymore. But uh, I've had letters from some graduates who said they they were they were glad that they they knew they had to be prepared. They knew they had to ask a good question, and I think it's it, they thought that it helped them as they moved on and were out in the in the, in the media world. So, but yeah, I, I'm definitely. But you know, it's like. 
you know, if you're a really bad guy 20 years ago, you're probably still going to be considered by some people a really bad guy, even though you've done a lot of good things since. They kind of go with that, that impression, and uh, you can't really sometimes overcome that. But, it, you know, that's... It's just that's just the way kind of the way life works, I think, for the most part. All right. So the important thing now is don't ask a question that I already asked. <laughs> Raise your hand, and when you get called on, please stand so we can pick you up on the mic. Talk nice and loud, and don't again do a White House type question. Just ask a question all the way in the back. That's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I a lot of the in the beginning was I just didn't want to do it at all. I just really did not like doing a press conference or talking. I just didn't want to. It was to me, it was like a waste of time. I just want to get out of here. I want to watch the tape of the game and see, you know, what's going on. So I was abrupt. I don't think I was necessarily rude, but I was. I, Again, one person's one man's abrupt is another person's rude. You know, it just depends where you're sitting. But I was quite abrupt and uh, you know trying to get out of it, get through it. And I wasn't trying to win friends or info. You know, I've always told me I, I'm not. I, you know, I, one guy always writes, "Well, he's not friendly. He's not very friendly." I'm not here to be your friend. You know, I'm here to answer your questions and help you do your job. I don't want to be your friends. I've got friends, you know. I don't. I don't need you. I don't want you to be my friends, and you shouldn't want to be my. The one another issue, and I'd like to always make some points, and they'll be all over tomorrow. But you know, when somebody in the media doesn't like you for whatever reason, like when I had that thing with Mike Lupica, he had never written anything about me. Two weeks later, he wrote that I was a bad coach. <laughs> and he had never he had thought I was a good coach up to that point, but because I got him, he was going to get me, but on a personal level, on a personal level, he he's going to attack my coaching because he didn't like me, and the two aren't related. You know, you cannot like me, but that doesn't mean you should. You can then say, well, he's not a good coach just because you don't like someone. So those things bother me when that happens, and it happens. There's no question. Some people in the media just take it personally, and they're going to come back to get you. And I think it took me a long time to just figure out that I'm better not getting I'm p getting people feeling that way because it's just going to be a negative thing down the road. The greatest media guy ever was Lou Carnesecca, and when he'd lose a tough game and he maybe could have done something, and they would ask, well, Coach, why didn't you play you know, this guy or why did you do that? And he'll go, yeah, it was an unbelievable game. I can't believe how both teams played so great and it's just unbelievable. And then the person would go, well, coach, what? And he'd, go, and he'd give the same answer right again. <laughs> he would never answer the question. Never answer the question. And he was a master with the media, and they all loved him. They all loved him. So that's really the best way to do things. I just... It was the sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike... Coach Mike Carter, master student broadcast journalism. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, I wonder, are there coaches in other sports or professionals in other industries that you admire or look to? Absolutely, I love Bill Belichick. Not not just because of his press conference, which are priceless, <laughs> <laughs> but. He's a, I, I, I've really never met him. I know a lot of people are good friends with him, but I've just never really run into him. And uh, I think he's an unbelievable f coach. I think he's one of the great coaches that ever coached. And, uh, you know, obviously I had unbelievable respect for John Wooden, who I met on many occasions and was the greatest basketball coach that we've, we've had. But uh, I'm a big, big sports fan. I admire a lot of coaches. It's a hard business. It's hard to be good over a long period of time. And, uh, you know, I, I just admire a lot of coaches and um, a lot of professionals. I'm a big golf fan, always have been, and Arnold Palmer was a guy that I did meet, spent some time with. He's a, really the classiest guy I've ever met in my life. He, he was all the time nice, no matter how many times, how many people he'd seen that day. If he saw a hundred people and shook hands with a hundred people and 
101st would come up to him, he'd stop and talk to him and shake his hand. And, and he, he was an unbelievable person. I think it's great when you have great athletes and great coaches who are great people. And, and a lot are. They really, I mean, I, I've been fortunate to be around a lot of them. And a lot of them are great. And some who are not great have fooled the media completely because you can do that. It's not that hard uh, to do that. And <clears throat> they sell themselves to the media, and they're really not good people. Uh, but, and there's some guys that are really good people that don't know how to sell themselves to the media, and uh, they write bad things about them. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's just the way it works sometimes. But, yeah, I admire a lot of people in coaching. <clears throat> it's a hard business. It's a hard profession. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I started in coaching because I, I wanted to play. And I, when I couldn't play anymore, that's all you got left is coaching. <laughs> Well, you know, I have a lot of friends in, in the media. Tony uh, Klein, oh, I can't even think of his name. Uh, Tony Kronheiser. Kronheiser. Yeah. I can't even think of his name. Mike Wilbon are good friends of mine, uh, always have been. And they don't even come in once a year. But well, Mike used to cover us when he was with the big, in the, when we were in the old Big East, and Tony did too. That's how I got to know him in the beginning. They were at the Big East tournaments, and they'd come to the big games during the year. Uh, you know, Dick Weiss, who's a, a great sports writer, basketball guy, is a, a good friend of mine. Um, but, uh, you know, I I, uh, I like a lot of the guys that, that come in. You don't see them a lot, but there's a lot of really good people. But um, and I, by and large, like the guys, the people that cover us locally. It's just you're going to have a, a rough, you're going to have a back and forth with somebody that covers you all the time because they're going to write something you're not going to really like and and that's they may be right probably not <laughs> but you know they at least think they're right <laughs> hey coach um, Bobby how do you and I expect your players to handle themselves with the media well it's uh, I, I've noticed it's an, an interesting when they come in as freshmen how some really struggle and yet when you see them three or four years later and of course, not they don't all stay now that long. But when the ones that do, how good they get at handling the media. We we ask ask them to take a speech course and the you know public speaking course, and we work with them a little bit. <clears throat> but I think it's amazing. We've had some guys, well, and all guys are different. Some guys are really good, really good with the media, and some have to learn. You know, it <coughs> takes them some time, and um, gradually they become better. You know, and, and 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 the biggest thing you see is is the change in players when they come in at 17 or 18, and you know when they leave at you know 20 or 21, how they've changed, matured, and you know we've had a lot of good guys. You know, you're you're always going to have some guys that struggle one way or the other usually, but um, in recruiting you try to recruit talent and personalities. You try to get guys that you think will fit in and that are good people. Um, but it's not, you don't always know guys. I remember once when I first started out, we were recruiting the best player in New Jersey. And uh, you know, you, you saw him a few times, but you didn't get to know him in recruiting. And uh, I went down to his high school graduation, which I don't do that anymore, but I was younger. So I went down there and uh, the kid had a great year and seemed like a really good kid. And I remember, I'll never forget, uh, we had a, there was a reception. And afterwards, I was walking out of the reception, and his father was standing there. And he, I went to shake his hand, say goodbye, and he said, uh, Coach, I'll tell you what, you got a problem. My son's just an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I said, oh, and you know what? He was 100% right. <laughs> he did not last a year here. <laughs> but, so you never know, you know. That's, that's a 
true story. I don't think I put that in the book. I don't know. But it was, it, no, I read it cover to cover. No, that wasn't in there. <laughs> There's a lot of good stories that never quite <laughs> get in the book, but that's one probably should have. It was absolutely true. I think he turned out all right. He's a, I think he was a sheriff in Florida or someplace. I don't know. He had guns up here when he was a freshman. That's one of the reasons he was not here. <laughs> and that was 30 years ago when people really didn't have guns. Now, of course, everybody everybody should have a gun now. Now, of course, a good reporter would say, well, gee, coach, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> we never release that. There's yeah. <laughs> some things we don't tell. It's like I once told a reporter, I don't always tell you the truth, you know. And she says, you can't do that. I said, well, let me give you an example. One guy on our team is just, he's a terrible player. That's why he doesn't play. But I don't think his mother would like it if when you asked me why he doesn't play, if I said he's a terrible player. <laughs> Do you think reporters sometimes take advantage of younger players who come in and maybe they're a little bit naive and well, the, ways the of problem the world with media? the players is, and this is a little nugget for you. When you ask a player after a game of what should have, been, what the coach should have done, or what should you have done, they have no freaking idea. They are young basketball players who know little or nothing about <coughs> coaching. Nothing. You probably might know more than them. So when a reporter asks a player what the team should have done, it's like, you're an idiot. Because he doesn't know. But they want him to say, well, they, uh, I think uh, we should have done this. So they can print it. And here's the player saying that. The public doesn't know that player. He doesn't know anything about coaching. <coughs> I do tell my players early. I don't tell them a lot. I tell them really a couple things. Don't ever say anything negative about somebody on your team or somebody on the other team. So in other words, and I give them examples, like don't say, well, we're much bigger than this team or we're much faster than this team. Because what is that? That's a negative. You can say they're really good, they're really quick, but you can never say they're slow or they don't shoot well. In other words, you can't say a negative about somebody we're going to play or somebody you're playing with. And the second thing I say is do not ever coach our team. I coach the team. You play. So if they ask you a question about coaching, what do you tell them? What's, what's your answer? What's your answer? Someone asked me about coaching? I'm a coach. Just ask the coach. That's your answer. If we can get those two things accomplished, we probably won't have that much problem with the press. That's the problem in pro sports. They go right to the locker room and the player says, well, yeah, we should have done this, or he should have played, or he should have passed me the ball. Now you got a controversy the next day. That's the, all, all the time. But a lot of times that's what reporters are looking for, is the oh, quote, yeah, the want, sound bite want, they from they you, want, from a player. They want that. They always want that. That's and that one. annoys you. And sometimes you'll just say, well, so-and-so should have rebounded. And the reporter will run right to the player and says, well, you lost the game because you didn't rebound. So now the, I didn't say that. But then the player will, might be, well, I didn't lose the game. He lost it. You know, that's how they, they love that. That's what they want. They want that. That's why we never get along that well with reporters. Hi, Coach. My name's Tom. Um, with so many players in your program who go on to the next level in the NBA, do you see it as not quite part of your job description, just, but just part of your role as acting as a mentor to them in terms of uh, teaching them about how to deal with the media, things like that? Yeah, I mean, that's all part of the job. And, and as we well know here at Syracuse, that I'm responsible if they did anything wrong or the program did anything wrong or Tudor did something wrong, I'm responsible. <laughs> it's kind of like if you're the president of the bank and a teller steals money, they don't usually fire the president of the bank they fire the teller. But in college, they fire the president, or they penalize the president. That's just the way it is. It's not right. It's not American. But that's the way it is. You just have to accept that. And uh, you know, if the coach should rightfully have known about something, then maybe. But uh, if the coach really has some, some things you just can't possibly know. But you're going to be responsible, and that's the way it is, and you have to, you have to live with that. But part of coaching is to take young guys and teach them the right and wrong way to play, practice, and behave off the court. And 
how many people here did something stupid when they were a freshman or sophomore or something in college? I mean, like, you know, I mean, come on. We were going back to the dorm. We didn't like the RA, and we threw a rock through his window. <laughs> now, I think the statute of limitations has run out because that was, that was 51 years ago. But you know, we did that. If we'd have gotten caught, we'd have been in big trouble. But in those days, you did things like that, and you could probably get away with them. You could get in a fight someplace and probably get away with it. Now you can't even get near a fight. Because I'll never forget, there was a fight on campus many years ago, and there were about 40 people engaged in the fight, and the cops came, and they arrested one guy. And it was our best player, Derek Holmes, 6'9", 230. And I asked the chief, I said, well, how come, I mean, okay, there was some problem. How come Derek's the only one that got arrested? Well, Coach, he was the only one we knew. <laughs> but that's what happened. True story. But... Uh, those things do happen. You're up. Hi. Hi, um, hi Coach Bayham. My name's Amber. Um, so I'm wondering, from your experience, um, how do the interviewing styles between men and women differ? And also, since I am um, a woman pursuing a career in sports communications, how do you think women in particular could improve on their interviewing I style? think the women I've always dealt with have been great. You know, I've always dealt with the, there's a lot of women uh, over the years that have got into ESPN and I've been interviewed by them or, you know, done things with them. Linda Cohen was a good friend, has been a good friend of mine for many years. And uh, Lindsay Charniak has just done some good interviews with me. And um, I, I don't think there's, uh, you know, I, to me, I, gender doesn't matter. Color doesn't matter. Um, you know. If you know your job and you do your job right, uh, you know you'll have you'll you'll be fine. There's there should be no difference at all in the way I deal with a, a reporter or host, whatever it may be. Uh, and I think that just watching, obviously, uh, ESPN, which I watch more than anybody sitting here, because I watch it all all night and. I usually am up to one or two in the morning, uh, and I think there's way. I mean, there's so many more women now. It's really obvious, pretty obvious, on, uh, especially on ESPN. But uh, you know, women. I have a women graduate assistant, a woman graduate assistant coach this year for the first time, and uh, she's great. She does a great job. Really, really does a great job. So. Uh, you know, if you're good at something, you want to do something, you know, you can you can work your way in there. It's it's, it's possible. You want to pick them? Yeah, right here. Hey, Coach, I'm Jonah. Um, I was wondering if you encountered any questions this past summer at the Olympics from foreign journalists um, that you, like, haven't seen before, like, say, like, from, like, the Post Standard or, like, He's like Syracuse. You know, I don't do I, the one thing of great about being an assistant on the Olympic team. They don't ask the, me, the assistants, that many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty under the radar. I, the, the head coach does most of the talking, uh, but I, I've had some interaction with with journalists who either they've had a player, known a player of mine, they, or a comment on one of their players, and. Uh, and, it, you know, the Olympic experience is a great thing. I mean, it's an unbelievable thing to represent your country. And that's why I wore my USA thing here tonight. But uh, I have my Syracuse shirt on underneath here. But, uh, the, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's great to, to coach the players. The NBA players are great. They work hard. They're great, great people, really great people. And... Um, to be able to win the Olympic gold medal and hear the national anthem is pretty special. There's, it's a pretty special thing, and we've done it three times. So uh, that's something you'll <clears throat> you'll always look back and remember. It's uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty humbling to stand there when they play the national anthem and you won the Olympics gold medal. Coming off of last season and heading to the Final Four, which surprised a lot of people, did you, Me see, too. <laughs> <laughs> did you see a change in the media and the relationship with you and the team? 
What? Did you like see a change in the media? No, you know, we had a good, I loved my team. I, th I thought they were really, you know, great guys. They, they just weren't very good it was to our standard, what we'd like to be. Um, I think the chaos a little bit had an effect on that, getting that, being in there, being out of there. Uh, but we really, in reality, we weren't, we didn't, you know, our center, day, day ones are good, hadn't played in three years, and so we were weak in that spot. We didn't have a good defensive center, which we usually have. Uh, you know, we had a, our, our best forward was a freshman. Uh, our point guard was really a two guard, so we really didn't have a point guard. It's hard to play in college basketball without a point guard and without a defensive center. So I thought we really played pretty well on a whole during the season, uh, beating Duke at Duke and um, beating, winning the Atlantis tournament with, you know, obviously Connecticut, Texas A&M. Uh, Gonzaga was down there. I think six of the eight teams at Atlantis went to the NCAA tournament. So uh, we, we did a lot of good, th we had good wins, that's why we got in the tournament. I knew we were gonna pretty much get in the tournament once they started taking teams that had good wins and we had the best wins of anybody that wasn't qualified. Uh, but when we got in the tournament, you know, we were in, I mean, the games we lost, it was, they were close. I and mean, nobody just beat us easily. They were almost, every game was a close game. And, uh, you know, we were at Carolina, two-point game, four or five minutes to go, and same here. And they were the second best team. They were really almost the best team in the country. But, uh, so we had a good team. And when you get in the tournament, some years we've had good teams in the tournament. We've gotten a bad break or we just were a little off and you're out of the tournament. And if we had gotten by that one game, we might have gotten the Final Four in some of those years. This year, you know, we, we, we played really well against Dayton and Dayton had a bad game. And then we get, you know, Michigan State gets beat. And even though Middle Tennessee was good, you know, they... they pretty much shot everything they had, I think, against Michigan State. And I knew they were in trouble when their best shooter said that when they asked him about playing Syracuse's zone, he said, well, we're good against zones, meaning that he didn't understand that our zone is not those zones. And uh, he didn't make a field goal for about 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so we got that break, and then Gonzaga was a good team, but you know, not a great team. And we were down, what, six with a minute and a half to go, and we pulled off a couple miracles and, you know, won the game. And we got a bad call, too, and overcame it. You know, that's the one thing about bad calls. You can overcome it, uh, but, uh, and we did. And then Virginia was just way better than us. They beat us three in a row. But they had never been to the Final Four during that great run they've had. And when we got back in it, put a little pressure on them, made a couple steals, they started thinking about, well, we, ooh, you know, we, we, we're, we're the best team. We should be going. And they missed a couple shots. They made a couple mistakes. And, uh, you know, you get through. We've had six or seven better teams that didn't make the Final Four. But this one did. And it was, it was great. It was probably in a lot of ways the, the most rewarding year with all the circumstances inbound and we're hoping to be a much better team this year and uh, hopefully we will be but you know we might not get as far you know, that, those things sometimes don't work out but I think uh, certainly on paper um, you should get your tickets for this team will, should be a good team to watch play this year. You know, in this forum, you're not allowed to ask that, but he's allowed to I, talk about I it if he wants to, so it, it's all good. But what she was getting at, Jim, was, was to, you, the media was somewhat down on your team, I think, when you were struggling, and then when you got into the tournament, well, the, the suddenly media, you were Cinderella. Syracuse and the media is the same. When we lose a game or two, we're no good. If we win two in a row, we're the best team in the country. It's just, there's no in-between. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's usually somewhere in-between, but we really... We only lost to really good teams. I think all the teams that beat us were NCAA tournament teams for the most part, I think, without really going over every team, every loss, but most were. And uh, they were all close. You know, two to Carolina, Pittsburgh beat us twice. We can't beat them even if they're not good or are good. <laughs> we, beat, we beat everybody else that they can't beat, but we can't beat them the last couple of years. Um, you know, we lost to... Mm -hmm. 
won at Duke, but we lost. Uh, and you know, when I was out, we lost a couple games. They just it takes a while for a team to adjust to a new coach, and we lost to Georgetown and St. John's, and you know, games we might have won. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, we played pretty pretty well all year, and we played. I don't think we played that much better in the tournament, but we made a couple key plays in the tournament and got further than we maybe should have. And uh, but it's always good when that happens. But generally, fans are. When they when they you win two or three games, you they think you're the best team in the country, and when you lose two games in a row, they think you're no good. And media too. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't always. They don't. The, the next real, thing you know, the, they're going to say you can't beat Patino. Well, the real media doesn't really like the professionals. <laughs> don't really usually make those judgments. That's usually the bloggers. And there, if you're even behind at halftime, you're no good. <laughs> I did look at a couple blogs this year for whatever reason. I'm not even sure why. And there was a couple that, like, I was too old and should be fired immediately or at the worst at the end of the season. And they were consistent with that the whole last half of the year. And then we started winning the tournament. Those names were no longer blogging. They just they don't change or uh, say apologize. They just don't write anymore. <laughs> they just pull it off. But, uh, you know, again, the, the problem with the blogs and that, there's probably about 30 total people that do all that. And some people use, do it under four or five names so that they can be creative. You really know who they are, but they, they change that. But 95% uh, of them are not season ticket holders. 95% of them invest nothing toward our program. If a season ticket holder is upset with me and wants to even say something, that's fine. He supports us. But somebody that doesn't come to the games and for the most part sometimes doesn't even watch the games, but it then is going to tell you how to coach, you know, you don't, you can't, you don't worry about those people. That's not something you think about or worry about at all. Whatever you do, stay away from Twitter. We have about 10 minutes. Who else has a question? Archer. Hi, Coach. I'm Luke. Uh, sort of along the same lines as what you've just been talking about, what sort of impact would you say the rise of the Internet and digital media has had on your relationship with the media? I, I, I'm not keyed in that much with the digital, with that stuff, and like the bloggers, and I don't hold the bloggers uh, as, as journalists. You know, I think they're crazy, naughty people that don't have anything to do. <laughs> when you're blogging stuff at 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, 6 at night, and 10 at night, you really don't have much of a life, I don't think. And uh, so I really don't equate that with journalism or anything and take that to heart at all. Um, it's, just, it's just part of the world out there. And, uh, you know, you gotta, it's, it just doesn't affect me that much. You notice how people always look around like, me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is earlier about your players' relationship with media. Do you ever find the media to be distracting to your players to the point where it can interfere with their ability to play the game? Well, that's one of the reasons we stopped having the media in all the time because we just don't want our players constantly giving interviews. Talk. I mean, we, we allow our players to interview anytime. The, the journal the media just has to go through. Our sports information director, if they have a question, they want to meet with Trevor Cooney, they, he'll set it up, they'll meet, you know. We just don't want them to be constantly going through the interview process and all that. We want to limit that as much as we can because it's not that beneficial uh, to them and to us. And in reality, fans want to know who won, who lost. They want to get a couple quotes of what the players think uh, within reason. And uh, we want to give them that. But we, we don't want them to be tied up in it all the time. It's, it's really important for players to focus on what they're doing and uh, not get involved in extra stuff, other stuff. It's not helpful to them. They, they need to really key on doing what we need to do. And uh, it's important for players to grow up in college and like they get a little more help, obviously, than most students do because they're also putting a lot of hours in. But they still are, we only use, have two and a half to three hours of practice total, six days a week. So 
you go to class, you have your practice, you've still got, you know, 16 hours on your hands, so you've got to learn how to grow up, how to get, get around, how to make decisions. And uh, I think it's, a, it's a, you know, part of going to college and uh, the ability to make mistakes. The problem is when you're a high-profile athlete and you make a mistake, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to bite you. And, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to realize that. And it's, it's part of uh, the lessons you have to learn when you're in the public eye. You know, and, just what it is. John. Hi, Coach. Uh, John Sirio. We talked a lot about the negatives that come with media coverage. How often can you get positives out of it, whether it be from recruiting, scouting, or maybe added motivation for you? Well, the biggest help for us with the media is our foundation. When we do charitable things, that we get that publicized so that we can get more people sending in money so we can do more things. We try to work with kids in the community, work with uh, cancer researchers, uh, locally um, so I, I think we're blessed that people uh, cover our events and people come to our events so we're able to raise a lot of money in Syracuse we raise a million dollars a year for our foundation and we probably raise another million dollars for organizations like Make-A-Wish and uh, you know cancer research uh, um, Boys, boys, and, boys and Girls Club, events like that. So we, we were able to raise a lot of money, and the more awareness we have with the media, that, that's helpful. Um, but uh, the media doesn't, it doesn't really help us that much because in reality, the media doesn't sell tickets. Winning game sells tickets. You know, people always, they write these articles every year. Why, why aren't fans going to football games? You know, why are, we need to do promotions. We need marketing. doesn't help. You win. If you win, you, you'll get fans. It's a little different when you're a true state school. If you're bad at Minnesota, they, they go to the games. The fans go to the games because they're in the state. It's the whole state. At Kansas or... Nebraska, those the people go. Syracuse, even though we're the big school in the state, we're not really like Rochester's team. If we were the state school, then people in Rochester and Buffalo would tend to support us more. So for us to get support, we have to be good. We have to win. Uh, we get basketball support because we've won consistently for a long period of time, and, and that took a long time to build that. And it's now, when we go to New York or Washington now, we have six or 7,000 fans. Georgetown stopped selling tickets. They, you have to buy five games to get a ticket for the Syracuse game because they don't want Syracuse fans there. And our fans still buy five tickets so they can go to the Georgetown game. And uh, when we start out winning, you know, we go to Georgetown, there'd be 500 people there. And now there's 5,000, 6,000. So our fan base has grown over the years, and our fan base is very loyal. <coughs> like we went to Atlantis last year, we had 2,000 fans in Atlantis. Before when we'd go to a tournament like that, there'd be 200. So it's really grown over the years, and it, it's, it's been very helpful. Uh, we have very loyal fan base. I mean, I have people constantly come up to me, and you know, my best friend is a Syracuse guy, that's all he talks about. You know, they, they do. We, we have great fans, really. We play in Florida because most people that are smart when they retire, they move to Florida. So if we play in South Florida or Miami, we get two or 3,000 fans there that come to the game. So it's, a, it's, it's built up over the years, and it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, you know, we have great support. I never thought that we would be able to draw 25,000 people to a game on campus. I never thought that would happen. We were averaging 9,000 fans, which was a sellout in Manly, when parking for all 9,000 fans. Now we're in the Terry Carrier Dome and we put 25,000 people and then there's parking for 1,400 cars. So we never, never saw that coming, never thought it could happen. Um, you know, it's really the sports story of all time in college basketball that 
we can do that in a relatively small town uh, in the winter time that pe we can draw 30,000 people to a game of basketball. It's a, it's a thing that always uh, humbles me. And as a coach, you have to have support. That's the one thing you really have to have is fan support. I mean, everything else you can get away with. You know, it's good to have facilities and that, which we have. <clears throat> but the one thing you can't win is you don't have support. If you don't have fan support, if recruits come and see us play Duke and there's 35,000 people there, we got a good shot at getting that recruit. If they come to an empty football stadium, they look around and they visit next weekend and they go to Tennessee and there's 100,000 fans there. You know, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? And uh, so those are that's a huge component, and it's this chicken and egg thing. Do the fans come first, or they come? Right? And its reality is, you have to win to get fans. It's that's just the way it is. And Syracuse is a pretty tough town. Not too many teams are successful in Syracuse. Not Two more fun. questions. I got no place to go. If you got a question, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. I can. I was up at four o'clock this morning, but I'm okay. <laughs> uh, hi, coach. My yeah. name's Justin. Um, I was just wondering if you ever look back at old interviews or press conferences and like maybe say to yourself, "Oh, maybe there was something I shouldn't have said." <laughs> One thing you learn in coaching: don't ever second guess yourself. <laughs> no, I don't study that. It's not that important to me. <clears throat> I mean, sometimes, you know, when you're blunt and stuff, you shouldn't be probably. It'd be better not to be, but, um, you know, it's uh, and, and And sometimes, I mean, you're just hot. You know, you go in after a game that you shouldn't have lost and something happened that you know, get a bad call, or, which you know, never happens, of course, but <laughs> it happens. And when that happens, you're hot. And now you're going in, you've got to answer dumb questions sometimes. It's hard to be, you know, like it's hard sometimes to say, not to say that's a dumb question, or you're an idiot. <laughs> no, <laughs> I haven't said that in a long time. <clears throat> well, there goes that. <laughs> All right, Coach, we'll stick around and yeah. talk to you and answer your questions one-on-one -on -one as we always traditionally do. But now from the audience, one more question, and then I have one more, and we'll wrap up this part of it. Um, eeny, meeny. All the way back. Um, my name is John David. Uh, I just was wondering, I know we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty and we're coming down to the wire with recruiting and mm -hmm. stuff. Do you think that media has an impact, whether it be positive or negative, on your recruitment process personally? I'm not, I don't think so. Recruiting is so, I mean, I could start talking about recruiting and give you an hour on it and still you wouldn't understand everything that goes into recruiting. It's a very complex complex situation and yet it can also be crazily simple and I'll give you a couple examples we've worked three or four years on a recruit before uh, literally started when they were freshmen and see them a maximum number of times follow them around the summertime and do all the communications you can do within limits and we can do that for four years and just think we did an unbelievable job you know and the guy will go to another school and somebody will ask him, well, what was the difference? He'll say, I like the color of their uniforms better. <laughs> and what? And the other school re recruited him for six months and we recruited him four years. And so you never know in recruiting. And I remember one year we lost the first four point guards we were trying to get. And, and of course what the paper does is write, Syracuse lost player A, Syracuse lost player B, Syracuse, which we might not even been recruiting that player. But because they thought we were, we lost a guy. We've already lost two guys this year that we didn't even recruit. <laughs> but, you know, we, they were on our list. But we didn't really want them, so we stopped recruiting them or low-keyed it. And, but, so one year we lost the four, our four or five top choices, and we got the sixth guy. And two years later, he was better than all the five we lost, who we thought were better. In fact, I remember going into his house and it's, he's a real good kid, and he loves Syracuse. That's why he waited, and his father sat there and says, they didn't want you, and you still want to go there? Because we did. We turned him down two or three times. And, uh, you know, he came in made All-American for us. I mean, it just, recruiting is a funny thing. I mean, when you see Carmelo Anthony, you can be an idiot, and you know he's going to be pretty good. But when you go to watch Hakeem Warwick, and he's 6'9", 155 pounds, it's like, 
you must be an idiot recruiting him. <laughs> and that he turns into be an All-American. So it's a very complex situation. And uh, you can work really hard. I went to see a kid 56 times one year back when you could go unlimited times. Now you can only go a certain number. But I'm, I, I went about 50 times one year to see a kid. And we lost him at the last minute. And I'll never, it was 10 o'clock Saturday morning when I found out. I didn't get out of bed till Sunday at 2 in the afternoon. <laughs> I was crushed. Crushed. That happens. Happens in recruiting. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it doesn't. There's a myriad of reasons why you lose guys. We thought we had one guy, and then all of a sudden at the end of the year he goes to Minnesota, who didn't even recruit him. And we found out that his girlfriend ended up going there, and so he wanted to go with her. Then he was there two weeks, and she broke up with him. <laughs> Which is why you don't do what your girlfriend says. He, he transferred back. He became an All-American for us. So it worked out <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Is that Leo by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but, last question from me, and then we'll shake hands with a whole lot of people. You've done a little bit of this in the postseason. One day you will retire, <laughs> maybe after two more years, maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> Can you see yourself doing analysis on TV eventually, Jim? You know, I, I discovered last year on my 31-day vacation <laughs> that it's not good for me to be home for 30 straight days for my relationship with my wife. <laughs> and uh, I just can't sit around. So obviously I've figured out that, you know, I'm going to have to do something. And I think the, the age things have all changed now. I think you can do things and if you're healthy. I'm probably the healthiest I've ever been. I never worked out from when I was 21 or two until I was uh, 68, two and a half years ago. I never worked out. And then I started doing Pilates, which I think has really helped me. It's very good, it's very tough. I have an absolute drill sergeant who does Pilates for with me and makes me do it. and. Uh, that's helped me. I do some other light stuff, so I feel much better uh, than ever. Uh, so I think you can go a long time, but I think it's good to be busy. Uh, and I think you, you have to have something to, to get up and per have purpose with. And it, some of it will be foundation work, and some of it will be, I'll probably work somewhat for the university in some capacity. And uh, I mean, I don't want to do a lot of analysis, a lot of TV. It's just, when you really think about it, how much fun is it on Sunday afternoon to do the Wake Forest Georgia Tech game in Winston-Salem, you know? I mean, how much fun can that be? <laughs> but you could be in the studio show. I'm going to take that do, as a firm maybe. I could do studio, but I don't want to drive to Bristol, Connecticut to do it, so I don't think, and I'm certainly not going to live there. So I don't see that happening, but uh, I, I don't know. It's hard to know, you know, 30 years ago I thought I'd coach until I was 50. And then I thought, well, 60 maybe. And so you never know what's going to happen exactly. Um, uh, I never thought I would coach this long. And I know that, I, you know, it's, it's like you, you feel, Mike Krzyzewski and I talk about this sometimes late at night when we're working through the Olympics and we're four o'clock in the morning watching some tape of Nicaragua or Nigeria or not Nicaragua, Nigeria or somebody who we beat by 65 points and he still <laughs> wants to watch the tape. But we sometimes reflect about just how lucky we have been. I started coaching here at Syracuse my first year out of school as a grad assistant. And I coached five years for $2,200 a year. And it was to coach the golf team and nothing to coach basketball. So I did both and was a house father and an RA and played pro basketball, semi pro, well, it was pro basketball on the weekends and went to grad school and sold insurance for four years, four and a half years. So 
I never envisioned. Then I got the assistant job at eight thousand dollars a year, went up to ten thousand dollars, and then when I got the head coaching job, my first contract was for twenty-five thousand, which in nineteen seventy-six was a pretty good wage, but it certainly wasn't anything like what we've seen develop over the last few years. But the bottom line is, you coach because you wanted to. You didn't coach because of the money. It's good to be able to make money. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, what America is all about. You know, if Tom Cruise can make $50 million for doing this bullshit movie, you know, <laughs> coaches should be able to get paid. Or if uh, some rapper makes $47 million for whatever that is they're doing. Uh, or if it, the best is the disc jockeys in Vegas, I become friendly with the guy that runs the win, and I'm sure you might be aware of this, but the top, the very top DJs that work in the big clubs at the win, can anybody have any idea how much they make for two hours? You probably really don't. $200,000. gods. For two hours. Two hours. Everybody just changed the major. <laughs> So there's a lot of that. So, so never apologize for how much, how much money you make, and you know, it's. Uh, and they're going to give you that to be an analyst too. So that's how it'll work. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm fortunate that I don't need to do something for money anymore. So that's that's a good thing. But I do so. I don't know. Who knows? I, you never know. You can never say, never. I'd hold your applause for just a moment while I stick in a word from our sponsor. Next Wednesday night, Serena Morales will join us from ESPN in this very room at 9 o'clock. Be there or be extremely square. And in the following Thursday morning, the 13th, after they are inducted into the WAR Hall of Fame, it's coffee with both Dick Stockton and Beth Moens. And Coach Beheim will probably join us for that and get some free coffee. Did I ever well. tell you I was the resident advisor for John Nicholson? Did I ever, did I ever tell that story? Did, I, did he ever he, tell you he that was, I caught an extra point? Thank you very much. He, well, he also didn't fully tell you my main exploit at Syracuse University. I was the undefeated quarterback three years in a row in the intramural football program, once for a dorm and twice for a fraternity, and never lost a game in the three years. It was my... One but, of my great accomplishments. But the best year, <laughs> thank you, the best year was the first year when you were the quarterback of the Sadler Three yeah, Dogs. We weren't that and you good. might as well tell them that you would have had a fourth year, but DU didn't keep you on. Yeah, I, they, they retired me early from DU. <laughs> right. The guys that we were like football lost control of the house, so the next year they didn't win the football championship. But I had a, I had a spread. What Syracuse is doing now, that's what we, we read spread, spread offense, and I was in great shape then because I was still playing basketball and I just ran around and they scored. And it's a little known fact, the quarterback who we beat in the last year was a, a lawyer, was a law school guy who played for the law school team. And the only game he lost in his three years here was to us. And his name was Richard Gordon. And if you're not familiar with that name, he went on to own the Hartford Capitals or whatever hockey team. and made a billion dollars. And, uh, but he lost to you. He lost to me. And every, time, <laughs> every time I see him, I do, I remind him that he lost to me. <laughs> We've been working on this literally for a year and for really many more years. Jim, thank you so much for doing this. Glad to be here.